guys. Uh, welcome to another episode of uh, Australian DeFi Association. And we're going to be talking about uh, Red Belly. Uh, my name is Arturo Rodriguez, and we have the pleasure of Vincent Gramola here, co founder and CTO of Red Belly. Thank you for having me. So, uh, please, just let's, let's start off talking about how you actually got into this space. Yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, as you said, I'm founder and CTO of um, Red Bay Network, uh, but we only commercialized these technologies back uh, in 2021. So um, my background is academia. Uh, I've been working uh, for more than 20 years on a problem in distributed computing that is called the consensus problem. And it turned out to be uh, central in blockchain technologies. Uh, uh, while I was working with University of Sydney and CSIRO, we discovered that uh, it was really important to come up with a consensus solution that would be uh, secure and efficient in order to solve one of the biggest blockchain challenge at the time, that was scalability. Um, so I've been working for um, yeah, quite some time on this uh, consensus problem that is central to blockchain, but at the time, it was, blockchain was not even there, right? So that was back in 20, 2004. Uh, I started working in the US doing my research. Um, uh, trying to improve consensus protocol, optimizing their performance. Um, but it was in a different context. It was more for um, with military applications at the time. Um, and that was in a smaller environment than what you can find in blockchain technologies where you have thousands of nodes. Um, then I moved back to France to do my PhD, uh, moved back to the US, uh, Cornell University, also to work on scalable systems. So it was the beginning of looking at how we can limit the number of messages in a network in order to get better performance at large scale. I did that for some time. I went back to, um, to Europe. I ended up at uh, the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne, where I did some research around uh, uh, distributed computing, but at uh, the small scale, uh, which was around multi-core processes. So how do you uh, leverage multiple processes that are running concurrently and exploiting the same resources? So we call them threads, essentially, so multi-threading. Uh, but it has the same property of a large distributed system in the sense that you have inconsistency that happen at times and you have to resolve this in order to get the benefit of having multiple resources instead of just one. Um, and that's when I, I got a, a position to come to Australia and, uh, and decided to join University of Sydney that was back in 2012, uh, time flies, so 12 years ago. I've uh, been teaching distributed systems for quite some time over there. And I teamed up with uh, CSIRO, the Commonwealth Science Industry Research Organization, uh, in order to look at uh, other problems, problems that would be close to the industry. And in particular, we were very interested at in blockchain technologies. So when, uh, when my research group at the time uh, at CSIRO said, okay, we should look into blockchain technology, for me, it was like, okay, let's try to tune what is the consensus solutions that exist, but for the, uh, the environment of a blockchain technology that involves many nodes across the entire world, so with a large distance between each uh, pair of nodes. And that's what I've been focusing on. Um, we looked at Ethereum to start with, that was back in 2015 when it came out, and, uh, and we found some problems. So we found that we could run some attacks uh, against the network and then double spend in the exact same setting that was used by a consortium of financial institution, uh, which is called R R3, and also um, a large bank here in Australia. And then we realized that there was something to be improved, right? And we thought, okay, because given what we know about consensus, we should be able to do something that will not end up having this double spending attack. Um, and for those who are familiar with the tech, then essentially it comes from forks. So we thought, okay, let's try to reach consensus before appending a block, and therefore we will never have a fork. Uh, and that's what brings us to finality. So once we uh, designed this, we decided to patent it um, with CSIRO, and then we commercialized it back in 2021, and that was the beginning of Red Bunny Network as a company. Uh, since then, we have made uh, a lot of progress. We have grown uh, quite fast. Uh, we have a team in Sydney, a team in India, and now we're really um, addressing um, a topical issue, which is real-world assets, and in particular, compliant asset tokenization. So if we, if we try to make it understandable to, to people that are not in the blockchain industry, first off, what is consensus and why is it important? 
Yeah, so consensus, it might look like a very simple problem to solve. Yeah. Uh, it's basically the idea that you would like multiple nodes or computers uh, that are part of the same network so they can exchange messages to agree on something that is as basic as a bit, right? It could be one or zero. And for all these machines to agree, it's very difficult. So essentially there are three properties that define a consensus problem, one of which is the agreement. Note, there is no pair of machines that should disagree, which means there could not be one that says zero while the other says one. There's another property that says termination. Eventually, the machines or the nodes should reach a decision. So they should output one or zero, but not nothing. And finally, validity, there is this property that says that one of the values chosen uh, doesn't come out of thin air. It's not a predetermined value. It's something that the nodes agreed upon. So maybe a value that some of the node had as an input at the beginning of the process. And that defines the consensus problem. So it's just for machines to agree on something as simple as a bit. And um, is there a simple way of explaining the difference between the consensus mechanism, for example, within Ethereum and, 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 and Red Belly? The differences between them? Yeah, so, yeah, and that's, uh, it, it took us uh, more than two years to come up with an understanding of the consensus of Ethereum. Uh, and then it took, uh, I think, uh, a bit more time for Vitalik to respond on a Reddit thread where he said, yeah, 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 we have read your paper, uh, actually, Ethereum assumes synchrony. So the big difference is that for Ethereum to work according to the synchrony definition is that all the messages have to be delivered in the Ethereum network with uh, a maximum amount of time that is upper bounded by a delay that is known by everyone. So it's, it's quite tricky as a property. Um, it's reasonable to say that there is a bound on the delay of delivery of any messages, especially if they are being resent again and again and again. We know that eventually they will be received by the destination, usually, right? Uh, especially if you use the internet, if the internet is broken at some place, it will be fixed later on and the message will mm -hmm. go through. What is extremely hard... May, is may I pause for one second? So if we make that... So let's say that we have three computers, right? No, three people. That upper bound means that each one of these is supposed to say, I think this is true. And they have X amount of time to tell the other two that... That, to send that message, correct? Yes. Okay. They, they have to all agree that if they send a message at some time T0, it will be delivered at time T0 plus delta, okay. and this delta is known by everyone. Okay. Right? What is very difficult on the internet is to know this delta. Yeah. Right? I mean, Australia experienced some issues because it's a bit isolated. So if yeah. you have a, a big earthquake in Hong Kong and you have a big hub on, that is impacted, and who can predict that yeah, the message will go through in less than one minute, then less than two seconds, or less than uh, 200 milliseconds, right? It's does, very hard. Does that mean then that, for example, if something happens between the connectivity between these three, this guy becomes a bit slower, does the input from this node then not get taken into account into the consensus? Exactly, and... So that hurts decentralization to a certain extent. Yeah, and it's even uh, worse than that, is that if these guys assume that no one else could have sent yep. a message, yep. it makes things even worse. They may, they may think that the information coming from this guy is irrelevant, right? Yep. So they may, they may progress on their own and say, okay, we're going to append a block to the blockchain mm -hmm. without having heard about a block that has been created in the US, for example, yep. because it's too far away and maybe there was a, a network yep. attack. So exactly, the, the, the problem we found in Ethereum were caused by network delays. So yeah. we simply had to do BGP hijacking attack or ARP spoofing, which is a network attack, mm -hmm. in order to delay the messages and in order mm -hmm. to double spend. So the, is, it, is it reasonable then to say that we have, uh, we have a, a blockchain user here that uh, wants to send tokens, as an example. That's a, a, <clears throat> it's a statement to make a change in the ledger of that token. Now, that's an execution that gets sent to the blockchain, meaning that it goes to every single one of the nodes, and each node separately calculates that difference or executes that statement. And then they need to communicate saying that the ledger was here before, it is here now, and let's agree on what here now effectively means, right? Yeah. So in, in, uh, in an extreme scenario, node one becomes really slow, 
Note 2 becomes really slow. And then node three is effectively the one that decides what the next state, state of the blockchain is. And if this node then gets taken over nefariously, then you have an attack. Yeah, even the fact that this guy can be faster than the two introduces some inconsistency. But the real uh, problematic attack would be double spending. And how do you end mm -hmm. up with double spending? It, it's not only that this guy is ahead of everyone with a block, but there is someone else that is also very fast, but yeah. with a different block mm. at the same index. And yeah. now you get the double yeah, spending. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, as soon as you have this inconsistency, there is still a chance that these slow nodes catch up with the fast node. Yeah. But if there is another fast node that pretends uh, something different, then you're yeah. in trouble. Yeah, amazing. So how's Red Belly different? So yeah, in Red Belly, we don't have this, prop this assumption of saying everyone knows Delta, right? So mm -hmm. Delta can be anything. Uh, it, 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 uh, it is not known in advance, right? So the only assumption that Red Bull is making is that if uh, messages get dropped at some point or get delayed, they will be uh, eventually delivered if they are resent again and again and again. And as soon as this assumption is, is met uh, without knowing any delta, then we guarantee that consensus will be reached. And moreover, we only append a block after reaching consensus on the uniqueness of this block for the given index. Well, Ethereum will append the block first and then will try to reach an agreement, right? So it, in, in Ethereum, you might have this transient period of time where you have these agreements that are easily recognizable as forks, right? You have mm -hmm. multiple blocks for the same index. And then it will, uh, let's say, merge these branches and uh, reconcile and eventually reach mm -hmm. agreement, right? In Red Belly, we don't do that. We first solve agreement and then we append the block, which means it remains a chain. Is that why, and by, bear in mind, I'm not an expert in the, in the field, is that why you get instant finality? Yeah, exactly. Because as soon as you append the block, you know that it will not change. There is no conflicting yeah. block somewhere yeah. else because consensus was already reached, which means that all the, the transactions you see in the blockchain are final. Yeah. You don't need to wait for yeah. confirmations. Yeah. So in layman terms, it's almost like Ethereum takes a bit of a YOLO approach as in commit the block and then Let's figure it out, while as Red Belly figures it out first, yeah. and then yeah. commits. Yeah, and I would say that that's the classic pattern that Ethereum uh, has followed, right? Bitcoin does the same thing. Yeah. There is uh, blocks that are appended, and then there is uh, an attempt to reconcile these blocks in order to reach consensus later on. Mm. We did the things the other way around. Mm. That's fascinating. So uh, that has very big implications in the financial sphere, right? Yeah, finality is, 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 uh, is something that is very important. Um, so it's important because, you know, what you see is what you get is very important as well. And if you know your transaction happened, you're happy to know that it won't be rolled back, that it's probably mm -hmm. committed. So it's good to have finality for this. But it's also very important for, um, uh, it might not be necessary for all types of application, right? If you're talking about toy apps or, you know, if you're, you know, using a blockchain, uh, with something that is not of high value, then it can be understandable that you don't really care about finality, right? You know that eventually things will happen and reconcile and you should be okay. Mm. But when I think it makes a lot of sense to have finality is when you're talking about real world assets or assets that have an extremely high value. If you're talking about mortgages, if you're talking about your house that are tokenized on a blockchain, you don't want to hear that your transaction is successful and then two months later realize that it has mm. been rolled back. Yep. Right? That, that would be a, a big problem. Yeah. So as soon as you ta talk about tokenizing assets from the real world on a blockchain, then I think finality makes a lot of sense. So would it be fair then to say that in, in the Ethereum scenario, we are settling a trade, and if I then have a system that is waiting for that check saying, we're done, right, finality, then uh, uh, I submit this to the network, and let's say that the network is congested, or maybe that's not the right term. Let's say that a few of the nodes are just not able to respond that quickly, right? Then in the Ethereum scenario, we will get a response back quickly saying this is what we expect is the true output. But then we have to choose how many blocks we're waiting for that finality to occur. While as in the exact same scenario in the Red Belly network, you would just wait for that tick to happen until the network has figured it out yeah. and then finality is set. Yeah. 
And that's probably, you can see it as a drawback of Red Bay Network, maybe. Like, uh, Ethereum has made the choice uh, of offering what we call availability. Uh, while we know that it's impossible to offer partition tolerance, consistency, and availability, right? Yeah. We've made the choice of offering consistency. So in yeah. case of partitions, what Ethereum would do is they would say, yeah, as you said, yes, we have received your transaction as soon as it re one node receives the transaction. But it doesn't mean that this view that is taken by one node is consistent across the network. Yeah. And my, what could go wrong is that later on they say, oh, by the way, I made a mistake. Uh, the other node is telling me that the transaction I, I told you was committed has to be rolled back, right? Yeah. So there is no consistency, but there is availability. So the user is happy because he gets instant feedback, but this feedback might be inconsistent, yeah. might be wrong, right? We have taken the other approach that is promoting consistency over availability when you have a, a partition, which means that the network, as you said, might be slower at responding or may say, hey, wait a little bit because I'm, I'm, I'm having an issue reaching the other side of the network. So I cannot tell you that your transaction is committed. Um, and that's the particularity mm -hmm. of our network. But if the node tells you that, yes, your transaction has been committed, then you can be reassured that this is the case yeah. and that it will never roll, roll because back. Ethereum doesn't really have that feature, and again, I'm not sure about this, it's more of a question. It doesn't really have the feature whereby you can, you know if you have finality. You make the choice of how long you want to wait for that finality to be def You define finality in terms of, of how much you want to wait mm -hmm. for a potential rollback. Is that, is that accurate? I, I think, I, think I, I'm, I, rem I, I remember uh, many proposals on yeah. the improvement of Ethereum, including um, uh, one that was suggested by Vitalik, or at least he mentioned it in one of his presentation where he said, um, we could think about finality that would be based on the, the client perception, perception, right? So we could think about, um, I don't know if it has been where, where it's at in terms of progress, but I, I remember people mentioning that maybe depending on the, the client, in Ethereum, they could increase their um, uh, reassurance that their mm. transaction that they have seen is truly uh, final, right? Yep. By by changing the way they interact with the rest of the nodes. Um, but again, I'm, I'm yeah. not an expert in. What so has been if proposed. if we try to overlay this on financial terms, I guess it's pretty fair to say that finality has an extreme cost on financial systems, right? Because many exchanges will have a lot of collateral sitting there waiting until fin finality, which typically in financial terms is T plus two, mm -hmm. right? Because things go wrong within that wait for a finality period or be between the period where you, somebody tells you, yes, you have traded at this price, but you're not sure until the trade is completely settled, right? Those effectively two days. And in case something goes wrong w within those two days, somebody needs to pony up the, the financial error in, in that, right? Yeah. So that is more akin to a certain extent with what happens in, in Ethereum. It's just that Ethereum does it obviously more efficient than the yeah, T plus two. less than two days, yeah. Yes. But nevertheless, it's not until you actually have finality where, where you can, where you don't need to have that financial bond, let's say, because there could be errors yeah, there yeah. between, right? No, I totally agree. Like in financial system, time is costly, right? So yeah. you need to know where the assets are in order to make, uh, um, you know, reduce the costs essentially. So by, uh, by automating and by speeding up the process, then of course you, you reduce the, the cost associated with the transactions. Now in the case of Ethereum, what is even more problematic is that if, if you have um, a network attack, you know, Bitcoin has been hacked. Um, there was issues with uh, Ethereum Classic, same thing, double spending happened. So we know that the, uh, the um, but the, the protocol has evolved tremendously since then, right? So it was probably back in 2021. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, but yeah, so this, these problems of uh, where you can have not only this period of uncertainty because you're waiting for confirmation to happen, and it would be much less than two days usually in Ethereum when everything goes okay, but if you have a network attack, now you can have a, a big problem, right? Because you expect things to be finalized after less than two days on Ethereum, of course. But then if there was a network attack, then you may realize even a week later that actually you got, uh, you got, like you got your assets stolen, right? So that's, that's the principle of this double spending attack. 
Um, now, you know, Ethereum has also uh, changed uh, radically with the merge. They have moved from mm -hmm. proof of work to proof of stake. They have, um, you know, shifted from the classic Bitcoin model. And I think it's going in the right direction. Like mm -hmm. what they have done is, is very good. Uh, also for the environment, like for all the mm -hmm. uh, all the reasons, but I think it's 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 going in the right direction, and um, but it's still a different notion of consensus yeah. that they are solving that is not exactly the the deterministic consensus that we offer at Red Bee mm -hmm. Network. Well, it's different use cases, right? It's a, at the end of the day, they're two different tools, mm -hmm. and they solve problems that are best described in different scenarios or different sectors. Yeah. yeah. So, how about uh, throughput? Because yeah. that's a different thing, right? Yeah, so I'm already, I'm always a very, uh, um, how do you say, uh, cautious about you know delivering mm -hmm. numbers without context. Um, but uh, but so let's not do the numbers. Let's just talk about the principles of why is throughput good versus other networks. Yeah, the throughput is not the the entire goal, right? Yeah. I mean, there is latency that is very important. Okay. So you're happy if you can, you know, uh, have a lot of transactions per second being committed. But it's also very important that you have a, a, a let's say, a, a short response time, right? right? Like for availability, for yeah. example, as a user, you want to know whether your transaction has been committed. So latency is very important. Throughput only tells you that okay, this is the, this there is this very big batch of transaction that can be treated per unit of time, but it doesn't tell you when this batch was initially created. Yeah. If it was three days ago, then three days latency is not good enough, right? So you really have to um, look at throughput with latency when you yeah. look at the numbers. But when I say I don't want to give the numbers only is because I think it's important to give the context because otherwise someone will come up with, oh, we have the fastest blockchain in the world. And it happens so, so many times um, just because they have run, you know, this uh, super mainframe machine with um, uh, capable GPUs, special Intel instruction, and then they were able to have very in a, good In a lab environment. Yeah, in a live environment, which is not representative <laughs> of what you will see of blockchain technologies. And then yeah. you end up having this blockchain, you know, failing yeah, um, of because now it's trying to scale on real, real machines. So, I mean, classic machines. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm very cautious about the number, but we can discuss the number. Uh, one number that was published, uh, and it has, it has made a lot of noise, was the 660,000 transactions per second that we obtained with the first version of the Red Belly blockchain. Uh, at the time, it was done in a lab environment with uh, UTXO models, completely different from what we have now with smart contracts. At the time, we didn't have the smart contracts. Uh, but also, we did that just to showcase the capacity of our system, right? So it's not representative of, of a worldwide deployment, but we also, we also did the worldwide deployment to show that the latency was lower than uh, three seconds on average. But all these uh, results are well documented in a scientific publication that has been published at the IEEE Security and Privacy Conference, which is the flagship uh, cybersecurity conference uh, in science these days. So everything is there. It's public information and it can be reproduced by others uh, because of the details that we have provided around it. Um, now we have new results. They are slightly different, but they, they involve this Turing complete programming language. So now we have really um, anything that you can express in Solidity can be executed on our platform. The performance is not that high, but we have run uh, experiments uh, that was uh, very recently where we achieved uh, 15,000 transactions per second in a worldwide deployment. So yeah. it's, uh, it's very interesting. Like the result is, is um, really good compared to whatever I've seen so far. We also developed a benchmark where we tested the uh, Avalanche, Algorand, uh, Ethereum, uh, Solana, uh, DM, uh, Quorum, and I can tell you that, you know, that this performance is, is quite superior. Amazing. So Vincent, you have, um, you have some big news. Oh yeah, I, uh, yeah, I was in Brisbane last week uh, and, and there is this conference which is called the IEEE IFIP, IFIP um, Dependable System and Networks Conference where you have all these researchers um, coming from all over the world and meeting. And this is the first time in 54 years of this conference that it was organized in Australia. So I was super proud of it. Uh, and I didn't have to go too far. Yeah. So <laughs> that was also a relief for me. Um, and then we, uh, we published this paper about zero loss blockchain. It's the first blockchain, as far as I'm aware, that can tolerate... Um, colluding majorities, right? So it means that if you have a network and you have more than half of participants that are trying to hack your system, 
then the, system, the, the blockchain recovers from that. Usually, it was not the case. If, if it happens in Ethereum, Bitcoin, in any blockchain that I know of, the, the blockchain will be gone, right? It will stop and it won't be usable anymore. Um, typically, the hackers will steal the assets from the blockchain. So this paper showed that we could actually recover from this state using something that we have uh, worked on for quite some time now. I think we started in 2019, so five years, which is called accountability. So we implemented accountability in blockchain using cryptography. And using this, it's a bit of a magic, but using this, you can recover from this state where more than a majority of the participants are malicious, are, are colluding in order to break your network. Uh, so it's very uh, impactful. And, uh, and we received a base paper award at the conference. So that was a, a big Congratulations. Outcome. Yeah, thanks. So is, it, um, is there a scenario where we can hypothesize the importance of this? Uh, no, let me reframe that. What scenario, even if hypothetical, do you think could happen where people, for example, try attacking Ethereum? or another high value network where this feature would be really important. Yeah, so typically uh, if, if you can grow the network size to something that is very large, then it's hard for, mm -hmm. um, let's say, an adversary to bribe enough participants so that it will have control over a majority of the network, right? So it's very yeah. hard on Ethereum uh, main chain, let's say, yeah. right? But if you want to run a, a, a fork of Ethereum, let's say an Ethereum classic or it's very likely that you will have less resources, yeah. less nodes that you would have yeah. on the main chain. And therefore, it's much easier for an adversary to, to come along and just bribe a, a yeah. majority of the people and break it. Um, also, I don't know, for geopolitical reason, if you have more than, um, you know, most of the nodes that are uh, spread uh, in some continents versus another, you can imagine that, uh, you know, there could be a, yeah. a way to take over this continent or multiple continent and therefore get control over more than a majority and break the blockchain system. Uh, this is not impossible, but the, the effect will be devastating. Yeah, that's fun. That's amazing. Look, I mean, just to be clear, I'm a big fan of Ethereum. I think that it's, it's done... It's an amazing network. It's done amazing things. Um, so it sounded very bearish from, from my point of view in terms of the, the making the differences. But I think that it's really important to state differences because they will apply, or rather they will affect different use cases. Right? It's, it's well known, I think, that it's really difficult to run a financial system on Ethereum for a number of reasons. One of them is... is uh, uh, volatility in terms of gas fees. Oh, yeah. uh, the other one, of course, is, is the finality issue, which most banks talk to, especially when it comes to, to use cases with a lot of activity, yeah. where you need to have fast trading outputs, for example. Right? Um, but uh, it's really exciting that you guys are addressing many of these, many of these issues and, and building a network that is specifically purpose-built. Yeah to solve yeah. and uh, yeah you mentioned problems. this uh, volatility and, and i agree with you i think ethereum has um progressed so much the blockchain space that we have also reused a lot of great ideas yeah. and the reason why we've decided to be compatible with solidity is because ethereum has managed to build the largest ecosystem yeah. of decentralized application that exists and by offering compatibility with solidity you know, in the EVM, the Ethereum virtual machine might not be the best EVM, the, the best virtual machine for languages, right? Because of the lack of type safety, for example, or, you know, we could do better. But at this stage, what we have is sufficiently good to run any program. Yeah. And that's, that's really beautiful. So uh, we really wanted to benefit from this uh, large ecosystem of decentralized application. And that's why we, we decided to go down the path of solidity. Mm -hmm. Now, anything that is written in this programming language that has been inv in, invented for Ethereum, can also be used yeah. to, to run programs on Red Belly Network. Uh, and in order to solve the other problem that you were mentioning about uh, volatility, uh, I totally agree with you. I think it's a major problem when we talk to customers and they want to know how much it will cost depending on the user base that they have. They don't want to know that there is huge volatility and therefore the price that they will have to pay will vary tremendously, right? They want to have some certainty about the future uh, so that they can also charge their, their clients yeah. themselves. Um, so the way we've done that is to make sure that, um, you know, the, the, the price of uh, or the gas fee associated with transaction will be uh, um, uh, fixed based on the U.S. dollars, which mm. is 
much less volatile than a cryptocurrency. Yeah, it's almost like going to um, a customer and trying to sell them uh, a cloud service or cloud subscription where they they constantly use the exact same number amount of resources on a monthly basis, but one month it's co it costs them ten, the other month it costs them a thousand. Yeah, it, it doesn't work it, it, in the real world. Yeah, right? it would have worked, I think. Yeah, uh, this is really really. Good. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for having me. In terms of uh, science so oh, yeah. research. Can, can you just right. repeat that again? I had to swap over sure. cards. Um, but can you just start from that question again? This is filmed in front of a live studio audience. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Well done. Well done. Yeah. There we go. I don't get an audience when I do my stuff. <laughs> <laughs>